Hi, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well and had a great Wellness Wednesday. My name is Crystal in Washington. I am the chair of the health initiatives. Um, uh, uh, the health initiatives of the Fairfax County um, chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Um, I'd like to introduce um, our president, Sora Helene Fisher, for our welcome. Good evening and welcome everyone to our program this evening. Thank you to Dr. Crystal in Washington, our chair of our health initiatives program for putting on such great programs for our community. And thank you to Dr. Prasanda Scales for joining us this evening for such a great program. I never thought in my life I would be so excited to hear about menopause and demystifying this subject, but we are so excited. I am not going to spend a lot of time here this evening to welcome everyone. So thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. And I would like to turn it over to Sara D. Williams to introduce our speaker for this evening. Hello everyone and good evening. Um, so tonight we have the pleasure of having uh, Sora Cassandra Scales speak and a little bit about her is that uh, Sora Scales was initiated at the Epsilon, Epsilon chapter at Michigan State University and a member of the Federal City Alumni chapter. She serves as the Eastern Region member of the National Physical and Mental Health Subcommittee. She's also a past national second vice president serving under past national president Sora Gwendolyn E. Boyd. Dr. Scales received her medical degree and completed her residency at Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York in obstetrics and gynecology. She now practices as a full-time OBGYN physician in Northern Virginia as the assistant chief of her department. She has a strong interest in women's health care and advocacy and has worked on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives locally and nationally. She serves as a national patient and health policy advocate from the other for the underserved and women's health as a policy member of the House of Delegates to the American Medical Association and with the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Her clinical interest includes various women's health topics, including menopause, fibroids, and contraception. She enjoys spending time with her husband, traveling, mentoring, and growing her tea company and cooking class businesses. Everyone let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Scales and we look forward to this evening's conversation. Thank you so much, Sora Williams, for that lovely introduction. I always cringe a little bit when I give these bios because I don't know, you know, what to say, what not to say, all the things. Um, but I think we have um, some information that is pertinent for everyone to know about recording. So I would give you just a few moments just to read through that. And then whenever you're ready, we can move on to the next slide. Delta Sigma. Oh, did you need to play that? No? OK. All right, so let's get into it, y'all. So I love talking about menopause. And today, we are going to demystify menopause. Are y'all ready? If y'all are ready, go ahead and drop a one in the chat saying, I'm ready to demystify menopause. Tell me all the things spill all the tea, just let me know that you are ready because we are going to dive in, okay? So next slide. So what are we gonna be talking about? So here's the tea, y'all. What we're gonna be talking about is you're gonna get an anatomy lesson about your body. So you would be surprised how many people do not know a whole lot about their body. Mainly what happens to their body once they hit 40, and beyond. It's all the stuff that you've seen your grandma go through, your mama go through, all these people going through stuff, and you have no idea what it is until you get to that point. But this is what we're about to get into. So we're going to talk about it. And my hope is that the anatomy piece is going to help to set us up for all the other things related to this topic on menopause. And so we're going to be going over signs and symptoms of menopause. We're going to talk about hormone replacement therapy, what that means, bioidenticals, natural remedies. And then we're going to throw in a little case scenario uh, once or two, because, you know, I can't have a talk without doing a case scenario. And I think it'll drive the point home. And then lastly, we're going to round it out to talk about what is life after menopause. 
the pod. And there is so much life to live, y'all. I'm just letting you know, it's okay. But we're going to go through it together. If y'all ready, let's go. So next slide. All right. So I am going to give my disclaimer that even though I am a physician and I'm a medical professional, this presentation is for informational purpose only. Informational purpose only. It is intended specifically to give you advice and not medical advice, but just some tips about what's going on in your body so you can take back to talk to your physician about, okay? This is not a, by any means, any direct patient care. So just take it for informational purposes, all right? So if y'all ready for that, drop a two in the chat and we're gonna keep going. Let's go, next slide. So what is menopause? Ladies, 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 ladies. This is the question that I say probably about every day, at least four or five times a day. What is menopause? So the definition of menopause is no bleeding after 12 consecutive months. And I mean 12 consecutive months. So when you are going through the transition towards menopause, you get all these symptoms that we're going to be talking about, but you're still bleeding. That's not menopause. If you still have your uterus, you they have no periods for an entire 12 months straight, then you're in menopause, okay? So, and I say this because what'll happen before that time is your cycles are gonna vary. So they're gonna go from maybe skipping a month, maybe skipping three months. You may not even see your period for a whole 11 months, but on that 12th month, if you get a period, child, you gotta start all over. And it's so sad. It is, it's heartbreaking when I get patients that get to that 11th month and then they get a little bit of a spotting, not menopause yet. Now, if you don't have a uterus, that makes it a little bit different only because you don't have a uterus so you don't bleed, right? So how do you tell that? And so we'll talk about kind of the average age range of when people go into menopause, but if you still have a uterus, this is the official definition of menopause, okay? Next slide. All right, so here we go. We're going into some anatomy, y'all. This is my favorite part because you don't get to see your body on the inside. So we're going to talk about this in a schematic form. So how many of y'all have known that this is what a uterus looks like, okay? So on the side, you've got the little white parts. That's your ovaries. So your ovaries are driving the entire process of the symptoms that you are feeling when you go into quote unquote menopause. And so there's three things that are about this slide that I wanna point out. So the first is the actual anatomy of what your ovaries look now. Now, some people's ovaries look bigger, sometimes they're small, it doesn't matter. They all do the same thing. And that's the middle part of this picture. So the middle part of this picture is kind of what happens normally when you are not in menopause. So normally what happens is that your body is creating this cycle of ovulation. And so what that means is every single month, your body is releasing an egg. And so as you get older, it starts to release less and less of those eggs, but the process stays the same. It's just this egg release, have a period, egg release, have a period, egg release, oops, I got pregnant, egg release, have a period. So it's kind of like the cyclical process that occurs, which is completely normal and functional. As you age though, over time, that process starts to slow down. That clock that we talk about stops ticking. And then eventually your periods will either become irregular or they'll just stop altogether. Now, the last part of this slide, which is this kind of pathway with all these arrows, this is really kind of talking about how all of this kind of fits together. So you got your ovaries that are just sitting down there in your pelvis that's doing all these microscopic changes that's even doing more work that's connected to hormones that are in your brain that are talking to your uterus to tell, to talk to your ovaries to tell your uterus what to do. So how I like to explain this to my patients is essentially what's happening is that you have these levels of hormones that are all of the things that are in that pathway that you see that are going up and down, up and down, up and down. And your uterus and the thing that is having a period every month is just responding to all the chaos that's going up above it, right? So it's the worker bee. And it's basically saying, I don't know what y'all doing. You need to figure this out, but I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You give me some hormones, I'm going to bleed. You don't give me no hormones, I'm not going to bleed. And so that process is what we call perimenopause. And so we'll go into that. But I wanted to give you a schematic so you can kind of see the pathway of kind of what happens anatomically, but also what's happening kind of hormonally wise and why we talk about it. Next slide. So 
You may have seen this, you may have not seen this in your health education class, but this is what happens every single month. So before you go into menopause, what's happening every single month is your body is making certain levels of different types of hormones. And so those hormone levels are going up, it releases an egg, and then it goes down. And if you don't get pregnant in between that time frame, then that's when you have your period. So for people that have regular menstrual periods that happen every single month, this is what occurs. If you're somebody that doesn't have regular periods and you never have regular periods every single month, then this occurs sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. But when you have a period, this is essentially what is happening. And so this is a normal, timeable thing that your body is used to. So it's kind of clockwork, clockwork, clockwork until you hit 40. And then it just goes all to the high heavens. And then you're like, I will get my periods every single month. Then all of a sudden, it's not happening at all. Am I pregnant? Or what is wrong with my body? You get all of these things. And that's because this process is not happening on a regular consistent basis. So if you all can relate to that, drop a three in the chat for me. And then we'll go on to the next slide. All right, so this is a good slide. So this slide is basically explaining what happens to your ovaries. So another thing I like to tell patients is when you are born, you get a certain amount of eggs. So you only get a certain finite amount of eggs that your body has for the rest of its life. So that means that every single month over time is losing the egg losing the egg, losing the egg. And that process starts when you first have having your period. So that was 10, if that was 12, if that was 14, that's when that process starts happening. Start losing the egg, losing the egg. So if on average people go into menopause, usually it's between the age of like 40 to 58. That's a long time. That's like 30, 40 years of this process of just losing the egg until the reservoir is basically empty. So the picture on the left, is basically what somebody looks like when they're in reproductive ages, which means that their body still has some follicles that are able to produce all of these different hormones. So you can see those little lines at the bottom. You don't need to know what the letters mean, but what the lines at the bottom are showing is kind of what happens naturally based off of that menstrual um, period that I showed you before. But as we age, that process starts to slow down because there's not any more eggs left. So that process can't happen anymore because it's empty. So then what ends up happening is that your estrogen levels go down. And then what people normally say, will you check my hormones? That one level goes up because there's no more left in the, in the bin. So it's, it's empty, okay? If that makes sense, drop a one in the chat and we'll keep moving. Want to make sure y'all got this because this is important. All right, I'm seeing some ones. All right, let's go. So what happens? when you lose estrogen. Is it just your ovaries? Is it? It's not. There's a whole pathway of things. Um, so you know that diagram that I showed you with all those arrows. All of that is just your body doing these multi-signal processes that's going on in different parts of your body. And there's estrogen receptors in other parts of your body that's not just in your ovaries. So we want people to have their periods every single month. It's not intended to cause you strife. It is not necessarily all about having babies. It actually does some other things to protect us as women to not get cardiovascular disease sooner. We don't get osteoporosis faster because we have estrogen. So the estrogen that you have actually helps to preserve your heart health as well as your bone health. So I say that because I have patients that'll come in and they'll have um, some issue where they wanna do like a hysterectomy and we'll talk about that briefly, but when I have a hysterectomy, you're like, you know, just take it all out. Mm -mm. If your ovaries are still working, meaning you get your periods every single month, then they're still protecting you from other things. So they're protecting you from getting cardiovascular disease sooner, which can increase your lifespan, or even prevent you from getting bone fractures. Those are the two main things. There's other things kind of on this slide um, related to um, other stuff. But those are the two main things in terms of like what's related to estrogen and how it impacts your health over time. So the longer we can keep your ovaries in place and functioning and working, the better. Now, with that being said, you know, there's a process that happens over time that eventually it's not going to work for you and, and you won't have any estrogen. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to 
kind of get everything back into balance and from that standpoint, because it's a natural process of aging. But it's just something to kind of be aware of that if you're if you have the option where they're like, oh, do you want to take your ovaries out for whatever reason? If they're still working and there's nothing wrong with them, you know, definitely have a conversation about um, retention and what that looks like. The other thing that I want to mention here is that you have estrogen receptors on your blood vessels. And so that is what causes hot flashes is when you don't have um, that estrogen support anymore, it causes your blood vessels to open and close. And it happens so fast that you start feeling warm and you still feel cold feel warm and you still feel cold. And that's just because of the way that the estrogen receptors work actually on the blood vessels. Um, so we'll talk about that in a, in a second as well. So next slide. All right, so what are some of the common symptoms that can happen when you go into menopause? So these are the common things that people will experience when menopause occurs. And so the number one thing that people always think about are them doggone hot flashes. And oh my goodness. Can they be debilitating? So some people will have hot flashes that don't bother them as much. So they may get a little warm every once in a while. They may feel a little, you know, cold every once in a while. Then there's other people that are like, oh no, I wake up, I'm drenched. I'm walking around like, is it me? Is there something going on that I don't know about? Everybody else, why is not the air on? You know, you have all of these things that are occurring to you. That's your own personal summer. And the reason for that is because you get that vasoconstriction and dilation of the blood vessels because of the loss of estrogen. Now, a lot of people will assume that hot flashes and menopause are synonymous. They are not. It is the process of the loss of estrogen that's causing you to have the dilation and the closure of those blood vessels that are happening really fast. And that can happen before you go into menopause because remember, the definition of menopause is no periods for an entire 12 months straight as long as you have your uterus, okay? So if you start getting hot flashes well before that time, that's your body maybe telling you that it's coming, but it ain't quite yet, but it's not menopause, okay? Now, the way I have the symptoms in are listed in order based off of kind of why people can have certain secondary symptoms that they describe when they're going through menopause and kind of why people think that hormone replacement therapy kind of fixes some of this stuff when it really is only intended for hot flashes, but we'll talk about that. So just imagine you're somebody that gets warm and hot, warm and hot during the day. Then you go to sleep and you underneath those covers and you got a lot of heat that's being generated in it. So you get warm and hot, warm and hot, warm and hot. That's when you get night sweats, okay? So hot flashes and night sweats are basically the same process happening. It's just happening during different times of day. Um, if you're sweating at night and you're constantly waking up because you're hot, then obviously you're not gonna get good sleep. So that can cause insomnia because you are tired of not being able to get to sleep because you're wet, right? So those things can be kind of synonymous with each other because you're just not able to get good quality sleep. And there's other reasons why people can have insomnia once they're transitioning to menopause, which we'll talk about. But it's just one of those things to just kind of be aware of. So situationally, this is one of the reasons why people have issues with sleeping is because they just can't get to sleep because they keep getting cold and hot real fast. Now, the next one is vaginal atrophy or vaginal dryness. So you can also notice this before you go into menopause. So as your body is slowly losing those eggs and losing that estrogen support, there's vaginal receptors, or there's estrogen receptors, sorry, um, in the vagina. And so those receptors, when they're not um, when they're not stimulated or activated, can cause your vagina to get drier and it can also cause it to get tighter. Okay. And tighter may sound like a good thing for some people. It is not. When you are trying to have sex, I'm sorry, guys, we're getting into it, okay? So when you're having sex and you are uncomfortable because it's like sandpaper and that's not okay. So what does that mean? That means that you now have a dry vagina, you have painful intercourse because it's so dry. Do you really want to have sex after that? No. So most people when they come in, they say that they have decreased libido and this kind of in that age range, the first thing I ask is, do you have dryness or not? 
Okay. Now, vaginal dryness is not the only reason why people can have de decreased libido, but it can be a main contributor related to why you can have not the desire to have sex because you associate sex with pain. And so what happens when you associate your sex with pain is your body goes into this flight or fight response. So it's like, oh my God, here it comes. And so when that happens, you're not going to want to do it, right? And then you have other things that kind of go on along with that. But that's part of the reason why people have a decreased libido. Vaginal and body odors can definitely be a thing for the same reason. So estrogen, not supporting the vaginal um the vagina as much as it should be can cause you to have an odor because there's a pH balance difference there. And then also body odors because the sweat glands and that vasodilation and constriction of your blood vessels can cause you to uh, generate bacteria on the skin that can cause you to have an odor. Now, I say all this to say that some people will have one of these, somebody may have two or three, somebody may need an unfortunate soul that has all of them. And then there's the blessed few that have no symptoms at all. That's so nice. It's really nice to be that blessed for you. And yes, um, Teresa says she has had no symptoms and I pray that you don't because it is can be a challenge for a lot of patients. So if you don't have no symptoms, yes, praise everything all above because it can be a thing. Yeah, and I can see that people have some, some or none or all. And so when we're talking about menopause and how we manage menopause, we're looking at what are your symptoms and what can we do to treat the symptoms, right? So we're not, um, it's not a one size fits all from person to person because some people have everything and then some people have nothing and then some people only have one or two. So when you're talking to your, um, your healthcare provider, you really want to kind of parse out those symptoms and then they can kind of tailor what's necessary to treat your symptoms. Next slide. If that's making sense, go ahead and drop a, oh yeah. Next one. So we talked about um, the average age of menopause. So the average age of menopause is 51. 51, y'all. 51. However, you can go into menopause anywhere between the age of 40 and 58. So there's always above the curve and below the curve. Where you fall in that track, nobody knows. Now, there are some studies to show that there might be some genetic links. So if people go, if people have um, moms or sisters that have gone into menopause sooner, then maybe that might be an indication that you might go into menopause sooner. Similarly, if you have people that are kind of direct line for you family-wise that have gone into menopause later, that that might be an indication that you might go into menopause later. That is all possible. However, the definition of menopause is no period for an entire 12 months, as long as you have a uterus, okay? Now, smoking can expedite menopause about two years earlier than average. And that's, you know, something to just be aware of outside of other things that's related to smoking, but just something to just kind of know about that, okay? Next slide. So what happens before menopause? So this is kind of the part where anybody that walks into my doors and they are over the age of 40, we have a chat and we tell them about the things to come or things that are, might be possible. Because what I realized is that our mamas didn't tell us this part. And this part is the part that really causes a lot of people some issues with trying to figure out what is going on. So we talked about earlier about how if you have timeable periods, you are used to them timeable periods, child. You know when they're coming. If they are two days late, if they are four days late, you check in a pregnancy test at three weeks. You got all the things, but you got it all together. And then all of a sudden, haywire. It's chaos. All things are coming around. You got irregular periods that have never happened to you before. You're getting them hot flashes that we talked about. You got the dryness. You change your mood, sometimes up or down because all this stuff is going on. And that joker can last for up to four to eight years. Because remember I said the average age for menopause is at 51. So if you start getting them symptoms early, it can be, you know, more than a notion 
Absolutely. Now, I will say about the mood swings, um, because I know that this is sometimes the thing that people do have an a issue with is like, you know, I'm feeling like my mood is off. I feel like I'm irritable. I don't want to talk about, you know, all of the things. And I really want to kind of take a moment to really talk about the natural process of aging in general. That is not necessarily directly related to your ovaries, okay? Um, we as women like to blame our ovaries for a whole lot of stuff. And there are some things that are a direct correlation to your ovaries and your ovaries alone. However, life still lives, okay? Life still lives. And so what that means is as we get older, our memories get a little bit worse, okay? We have a lot of other things that we didn't have as a kid that we had to worry about anymore. You've got parents that are aging. We've got demanding jobs. You may be going through a divorce. You may be trying to get pregnant, but you can't get pregnant. You may be doing all these other things about how you're managing life. And while life is lifing, your ovaries are starting to transition to that perimenopausal state and then eventually into menopause. And then you add hot flashes on top of it. You're not getting any sleep because you got hot flashes. You're worried about all the things that's related to life. And so those things are kind of piling on top of each other. As we get older, in general, our metabolism changes. So the things that we used to do to try to lose weight don't work anymore. I remember when I used to be able to eat 10 cupcakes. I never ate 10 cupcakes, but I used to eat five. And I would still be skinny, no problem. If I sniff at a cupcake, 10 pounds, it's coming. I don't know why. It takes a little bit longer for us to lose weight. OK, and I mean, this, suddenly I'm sad. I don't, I don't want to make you sad, but I'm saying that to say that life is still lifing as our ovaries are starting to transition down. And so sometimes um, when we're going through this process and we're trying to figure out what's the problem, what we're looking for is like, OK, how do we address the clinical kind of physical issues and then what are the other things that's lifing us at the same time that also need to be addressed to fix the whole problem so that's usually that nice deep conversation that you have with your doctors about all of those things all right next slide all right so there's this special category of women who go into menopause before the age of 40 so 40 and above, if you go into menopause, that is a natural progression. Anything under 40 is not necessarily a natural progression. And so if you go into menopause and have those no 12 consecutive months without having um, a period, and you're not on any medications that's stopping your period, you don't have any other medical problems, then that's called premature ovarian failure. And so that's something that um, should be managed and treated with hormonal replacement therapy because we talked about the heart health and the bone health. And that can be sometimes as simple as birth control pills or having a conversation with your doctor about the pluses and minuses to that. There are some people that have had to go into ovary um, to menopause prematurely because they had cancer and they had to have radiation or chemotherapy or something that, that basically inactivated your ovaries to the point where they're not making estrogen anymore. And so depending on the situation, they talk to you about how to manage your symptoms because some people with certain types of cancers are not candidates for estrogen therapy. And we'll talk about that. Um, or you may have had um, your, your ovaries removed for whatever reason. Like, and people get their ovaries removed for all different types of medical reasons. But if you only had one ovary removed, that means the left ovary or the right ovary, whichever one is still in place, is still functioning, okay? It's only when you remove both your ovaries that you are technically in menopause. But if you only have one ovary removed, that other one is still working like a champ, okay? So just know that that's a thing. All right, next slide. Okay, so I wanna drive this, press, this point home. Menopause is a natural and normal progression of aging. It is natural, y'all. It is normal. Yes, it is uncomfortable for some people, but it is natural and it's normal. And I, I really want people to understand that because I think what happens once we get to this point and we're trying to get treatment, people are trying to go back to yesteryear and you're not necessarily needing to go back to yesteryear because 
it's not something that's wrong with you. It's just what happens when we age. Just like our hair is gray, it happens, right? You can dye your hair and change all the things, but it's still gray underneath, right? So it's still something that is naturally occurring, but there's things that we can do to make it tolerable so that you can live your life as fully as possible. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. Next slide. All right, elephant in the room, hormone replacement therapy. Okay, so here are some of the big things to know about this, all right? One is that it is generally only designed to treat hot flashes. So its intended purpose is to keep the hot flashes bearable. Sometimes it'll make your hot flashes go away completely. Sometimes it will not, but it is intended to treat the hot flashes. It is not to improve your memory. It is not going to increase your bone density. It is not the magic pill for all things, although it feels like it to a lot of people because Going back to the slide that I mentioned about how everything kind of cascades on each other. If you can fix a major source of discomfort and um, functioning in your life, that changes the game. Because now all of a sudden, you're not having any problems with sleeping. So your fog is better because you actually can get some sleep. Who knew? Or if you have other things that's kind of disrupting your daily life, that helps to decrease the stressor. So that helps to manage some of those underlying things, but it's intended for just for hot flashes, okay? Um, it is, estrogen is good. So estrogen is one of those things where we know consistently that if somebody is a good candidate for estrogen, that it can help people. Now, what we do know is that there's different ways that you can take it. And so that's a conversation to have with your doctor, but there's some contraindications that I want to make sure that people know about. One is that if you have your uterus, and let's say you're officially in menopause, we have to protect your uterus because your uterus is estrogen sensitive. And what that means is that estrogen is stimulating the lining of your uterus. And now we're giving you something outside of what your natural body has done. So we have to protect it so that, you, so that you're not at increased risk for uterine cancer or endometrial cancer. So if you still have your uterus, you should be taking estrogen if you're a candidate for it. And then some form of progesterone to protect that uterus because you don't want to inadvertently give yourself cancer of the uterus because you're trying to manage your hot flashes. So making sure you have that combination is important. Um, it's, in truth, it's, in, it's intended to improve the quality of your life, but it does not cure all diseases. It does not cure you from having cardiovascular things. It's not gonna cure you from getting osteoporosis and all the things. It is simply to improve the quality of your life, which means that it is optional. OK, and so I say that because some people will come in and say, I'm in menopause. I need my hormones replaced. No, you don't. No, you don't. It is a natural progression of how we age. The only reason why you're taking hormone replacement therapy is to improve quality of life, specifically related to hot flashes with hormone replacement therapy. And it always should be monitored by a healthcare provider because there's things that happen as you take the estrogen over time that could put you at risk for other things that you wanna make sure that you're in tune with your body as well as with your doctor about. So they're gonna be checking blood pressures, cholesterol, and all the things that if those things are off can make take, taking estrogen potentially dangerous. Now, there are people that are not good candidates for hormone replacement therapy. If there's any concern for uterine cancer, if you got bleeding after you've gone into menopause, which is not normal, by the way, if you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you've had a stroke, you've had a PE or pulmonary embolism, a DVT in your leg where you've got increased clotting factors, and even if you get migraines, and the migraines cause you visual disturbances, that's an increased risk factor for a stroke. So you can't have that as well. And if you smoke. So those are kind of the big ones, but there's other things where it makes taking estrogen not safe. So let's say you're not a candidate for estrogen. What are your other options? I got an answer for you. Next slide. So going back to this dismal thing about your ovaries. So when you go into menopause and we're talking about hormone replacement therapy, this kind of drives the point of, you know, we're not replacing your hormones, we're managing your symptoms. So sometimes I'll get patients that'll come in and say, Dr. Skills, can you check my hormones? Cause I feel off. 
And so when it says that my hormones feel off, there are a whole bunch of hormones, as I showed you in that pathway that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. But the one specific hormone that's related to this that we all think about is our follicle stimulating hormones. It's not helpful to check that when you're like in premenopause because it can be up or down. But as long as you're in menopause, it doesn't really matter because we're just managing your symptoms. And so we're not replacing your hormones with even though it's called hormone replacement therapy. We're not replacing it to a therapeutic level of your estrogen should be above whatever. It doesn't work like that because it stays the same. All right, next slide. All right, so non-hormonal options. So there are some FDA approved non-hormonal options that work great for some people. Not as consistent as estrogen, but some people like we talked about are not good candidates for estrogen. So if that's you, there are other options. So I want you to keep hope alive, okay? Keep hope alive. Now, it's also intended to just treat hot flashes, but there are some versions of non-hormonal FDA approved um, replacement therapies that can also improve your mood. So, um, and the reason for that is because the types of non-hormonal replacement therapies that we have are intended for other things. So there might be a medication that would normally be given for anxiety that can also treat hot flashes at a very much so lower dose. So it's not intended to treat you for anxiety. It's just enough of a dose that helps to manage your hot flashes. And so there's different combinations of that that you can talk to your healthcare provider about, but that's an option for you that you can kind of get a twofer. So I'll have patients that will say, you know, I'm really having issues with my mood and, you know, I've got these hot flashes. Sometimes I'll offer them one of them because then maybe we can get a twofer at the same time, which is really nice. So just know that that is a thing. Um, it is great for people that are not candidates for um, the normal kind of estrogen replacement therapy. Um, it is the same, not intended to treat disease or illness, just improve the quality of life. Um, and just know that they may tell you about a medication that if you Google it, it says, this is for anxiety, depression. You're like, I ain't, anxiety, I ain't anxious, I'm not dip in depression. What's she prescribing that for me for? It's because they did studies to see what are some other non-estrogen options that will give people consistent results in terms of helping to improve their hot flashes. And so we have a, a list of them that could be helpful, okay? Next slide. All right, so natural hormone replacement options. So I know that um, this was a question as well that people had about, what about some natural remedies? Can I just do something else that's not a medication? And so the answer is you can. The other answer is that you can also not do anything. You don't have to have hormone replacement therapy. So that's just, these, these are all optional things to manage your symptoms, okay? So with the natural remedies, so there's a, a, a larger caveat that I'm gonna give and that um, you can try natural remedies. However, they don't have enough studies to know what can consistently work for most people. And that's what I tell my patients, okay? And I wish that we had larger studies to say, this number of many people took this amount of this type of herb and they got this benefit. We don't have enough data for me to say that. And so for that reason, I can't say that this is gonna exactly work for this person or exactly work for that person. So people will naturally just try something to see what works for them. And that's okay, as long as you have a chat with your doctor about it. And I say that because some things that seem natural can also cause some unintended things that can happen later with either um, um, reaction to your own medications that you're taking. So it may inhibit a medication from working as well as it should, or it could make your medication that you're taking for a prescription work too much. And so you get over-medicated. So you also, you wanna have that conversation with your doctor. Um, the bioidentical, so I'll, I'll just kind of touch on this briefly. So I've had people say, well, can't you just give me testosterone to kind of increase my libido? You know, isn't there something else that I can do that's like, exactly the replacement for my hormones. And the answer is, yeah, it's estrogen therapy. Like that's that's a bioidentical. So that's something that they've looked at to say this consistently will help most people at these incremental doses. Um, what most people are talking about is kind of like these boutique kind of compounded medications. And depending on the pharmacy that you go to that compounds them, you can get very different amounts of that particular combination. So the effects aren't going to be consistent. So you have to be careful about that. 
certain natural um, supplements that have worked for some people, but not everybody that you can take a look at and have a discussion with your doctor is black kuhash is tends to be the most common one. Um, ginseng to help with your mood um, or with memory some benefit there. There's this Indian ginseng that has this long name to it that has helped some people um, as well. But again, the results are varied because we don't have enough data on that. Um, and then if you look it up, some people say, well, what about um, evening primrose oil? And so you want to be careful with that one because it can't interact with people that are on blood thinners, but just something to know. Everybody wants a magic food that they can eat and fixes everything. Everybody, it doesn't matter what kind of disease it is, but it is something that people do think about. And so are there any soy products that I can eat that are going to make my hot flashes better? And there are estrogen containing foods like edamame and tofu, but the amount of the phytoestrogen that's in them is very small. So in order for you to get therapeutic levels of getting management of your hot flashes, you gotta eat a whole lot of them. So it's one of those things that it would be nice, but it's not a guarantee, okay? So it's just something to just be aware of. Um, there are a couple of sites that I do want to um, point your attention to, Herb Medicine and then the NIH Center um, for Complementary Medicine that you can use to Google anything that you're looking to try, and they'll tell you if there's any evidence for it, pluses or minuses. So that would be a good Googleable um, kind of resource for you, but always talk to your physician first. All right, next slide. So I'm gonna give you two case scenarios and then we're done because we're gonna open it up for question and answers, okay? So meet Susan, isn't she cute, y'all? So Susan is a 55 year old. She's got symptoms of night sweats, decreased libido, vaginal dryness. She's highly irritable with her family and friends. And she also suffers from blood pressure, med uh, high blood pressure and she's on medication. And she read something about hormone replacement therapy and wanted to know if she could get started on it. So what did I say to her? Next slide. So what I said and what I say to you is that high blood pressure is one of those ones where we can't really use estrogen replacement therapy because it can make your blood pressures worse. So remember I said there's estrogen receptors in different places, including the heart. So you can't use it with high blood pressure because it increases your risk for a heart attack or a stroke. So that's the reason why they're not trying to be mean, they're trying to be safe, okay? So then I tell her about the non-hormonal things that she can do to manage the hot flashes. Now for vaginal dryness, which I didn't talk about, you can use vaginal estrogen. So vaginal estrogen can come in a cream or a pill that can be used inside of the vagina to help to replace that estrogen to keep it more moist and supple, but it's a little bit more of a commitment. Um, and so as I talked to her more, you know, she wasn't really enjoying sex and that's why she didn't want to have sex with them because it was just painful. And she was tired at work too. Like her job was just getting on her nerves, child. So that's the reason why she had, was irritable as well. All right, next slide. All right, next one is meet Christina. Chris, uh, yep, femrine, yep, that's the estrogen ring. Um, so Christina is 43 years old. She's having random hot flashes, also decreased libido, vaginal. She got the same thing as Susan Child, but she's still getting her period. So that means she is not in menopause, y'all. Now, they've gone haywire on her and that she knows that something is off and she's really concerned and she wants me to check her on hormones ASAP. Is there any hormone levels that I can check for her? I get this question often. Next slide. The answer is yes and no. So the follicle stimulating hormone, which is the one that people want me to check most of the time, is very variable in your 40s because it could be up and down. So I could check one day and it's up and then the next day I check it is down and it tells me zero information that I can actually act on. Thyroid, though, can also be an impacting factor on people's mood, libido, dryness, as well as hot flashes. So checking your thyroid level can sometimes be helpful, plus or minus on that, just depends on your history. Um, and she can also try um, vaginal estrogen if she wants to, but she's not a good candidate for hormone replacement therapy because her ovaries are still working because she still has periods. So you don't give somebody extra estrogen on top of the estrogen that their body's already making because that's just too much for your uterus and you don't want to increase your risk for uterine cancer. And there's also water-based lubricants that she can try as well. All right, next slide. And I'm almost done. So what is life like after menopause? So we talked about all of the things that's related to menopause and all the things that you need to be uh, concerned about or, you know, uh, well-versed on. But there are some things that happen after menopause that you want to make sure that you keep track of. 
One is cervical cancer screening, which happens every five years up until the age of 65. You still need to get your mammograms one to two years. You should get your blood pressure checked at least once a year. Some of the stuff that we talked about in terms of mood and like prevention and all this stuff, all, all has to deal with increasing your water intake, modifying your diet, getting quality sleep and moving. If you do those four, four things intentionally in your life, you will be healthier and happier and more satisfied with your life, okay? So there is life after menopause. We just have to be more intentional about what we do than when we were younger, when it just came naturally, okay? And I think that is it. Any questions? I think we may have some, but if you do a QR code, that's just to give me some feedback on my presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Scales. Wow, this was super exciting. Like you almost made it seem like it was a good thing to be in menopause. Like I could get a little bit excited about it, but but your presentation was great. There were questions sent in previously um, when um, participants registered um, for the um, workshop this evening. So I was trying to scan through and you, you addressed many of the questions. So if um, I would just ask our guests, if um, I do not bring your question forward, just based on what was presented, um, please do raise your hand at any time and we can make sure that we get to you. You were very clear on what menopause is, when we're in menopause, 12 months without a period. That was one of the questions. You talked about the average as well as the number of years. So one of the things that, um, one of the questions that came up was kind of like a first indicator. And so things could kind of be in different spaces, but maybe you could just kind of touch back on that again, on what should you look for as a first indicator, that it be in your 40s or even in that age range, well, you're in the 40 to 58 range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so menopause um, is literally no period for 12 months. So that's kind of like the indicator that you've arrived. Mm -hmm. So that's the moment. Count when the last time you had a period, one, two, three, four, five, 12, no period, menopause. Okay, so that's the kind of thing. So if you start noticing that you're, and I say that because not everybody's periods will change. So some people will have their periods every single month and all of a sudden it just stops and it doesn't come back. Other people will have their cycles change. So their cycles will be either longer than they're used to, shorter than they're used to, heavier than they're used to, lighter than they're used to. And they have all of the things that are just kind of letting us know that over time, our ovaries are starting to trickle down. Hot flashes tends to be the most common thing that people complain about. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing that people, when they get those hot flash, they like, whoo, I'm going through the change. It's here. Are you still having a period, miss? yet but it could be a sign of something going on mm -hmm. now let me ask you this thank you for that so what what's some not so classic symptoms of menopause that maybe women may run into that maybe uh, you may have listed it but it's kind of like at the bottom or it may not have made the slides um i would say uncommon things people that's related to menopause i'm trying to think about that question um it's kind of a hard one because there's so many things that life is lifing that it just it it's hard to kind of discern between what's menopausal versus what's not menopausal. Um, I saw there's a couple of comments about um, potential belly fat, so mm -hmm. kind of having that abdominal weight gain, and that's aging. That's not menopause. So as we get older, um, mm -hmm. we get what's called central obesity. Um, so the fat distribution of where our bodies will accumulate fat tend to get more central the older we get. And so it gets in our belly gut. Okay. Um, and so that's not good fat. That's not the fat we want to have. I mean, we don't want any fat if we can avoid it, but that you don't want it there because all of your core organs live in the middle. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so because your core organs live in the middle, that's where your heart is. That's where your kidneys are. That's where all of the vital things that are keeping you alive outside of your brain that is now getting depositing fat. That happens as we get older. And so it's harder to lose that fat because one, our metabolism has changed and plus or minus, yes, could be related to menopause only because as we get older, we lose some of those cardiovascular protective effects, but it's not a direct correlation. Mm -hmm. See what, so what I tell people to do is do, do different things. So 
our bodies are really used to taking the last path of least resistance. So take it, for example, if you are somebody that's from New York, for example, I lived in New York for quite some time when I went to grad school. And before I went to New York, I lived in Detroit where I was in my car. And as I was in my car, I'm driving everywhere, getting out of my car, going to places. I got to New York, I got to climb stairs. I got to carry groceries upstairs and downstairs. You know, I'm doing a lot of walking. So the first like year, I lost some weight. It was great. Like, I just was like, oh, look at me go, you know, looking at everything. And then you tier, a tier, year two came, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because my body got used to it. It got used to walking up the stairs and taking all those groceries. So now it's like, oh, no, we got you. Uh -uh. We ain't doing all of that this time, boo. No. And so your body does the exact same thing as you're trying to lose weight. So if you're a person that runs, goes upstairs, does all the things, and you're active, then you need to switch up the different muscles that you're using and the different exercises that you're using. So you want to do cardiovascular one day, weight bearing the next day, and you just got to change it up and change up the type of activity that you're doing. So don't just do an elliptical. Don't just do Peloton. Don't just do, you know, what you're normally used to. You got to change it up because your body eventually is going to take the path of least resistance. Thank you. Thank you for that. So to that segue, how long um, can patients or, or women experience the symptoms of menopause? So they're on the other side. Someone just put in the chat about you know, maybe depression, um, just hot flashes, still insomnia, they're 60 years old. So how long can this go on? I'm sad to say that it can last for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I know. I wish, it's no like, I it's wish. no like once it happens, like it'll stop. There, there is no cut off to this. Oh. No, um, because your body's not making estrogen anymore. So there's no, like it, and um, so, okay. So I will say that there are people that have been on that have no symptoms, but people that have had symptoms for a shorter period of time. And then all of a sudden they just learned how to manage it so that it's not as impactful of their daily lives. So it's one of those things that you just start to learn your new normal. Um, and so it gets better only because you learn the new normal. Um, yeah, there is, you know, there was a thought at one point that people could not be on estrogen for a long period of time. So people that are on hormone replacement therapy, we had a cutoff that was, um, I think about like 10 years or so, because as we get older, life is lifing. So that means that your increased risk for cardiovascular disease goes up, increased risk for heart attacks, strokes, all of the things that would happen as anybody gets older goes higher. And if you're adding estrogen to the equation, that increases your risk exponentially. So the thought was, if you start developing those symptoms as you get older, then estrogen replacement therapy is not necessarily going to be safe. No. So that doesn't mean that you can't get anything. It just makes it so that you may have to try the non-hormonal stuff too. So it's just management. Management. So a question that came in um, just while we were talking, just as you were talking, you know, hot flashes, are there things that can trigger hot flashes and or make them more frequent or intense? Stress. And that goes to right. one of the other questions on the on the, that came in early about stress and the connection to menopause. Yeah, stress. The cortisol levels. Um, so cortisol is what um, is the stress hormone. So a lot of times people are like, "Can you check my hormones?" There's so many hormones in our bodies that it's just they do so many things. And so the main one um, in terms of stress is cortisol. And so cortisol can definitely impact um, your body's fight or flight response. And so what a fight or flight response is danger. It's oh my gosh, here comes danger. And so it then directs all of your blood flow into one direction, which is to protect itself. And so when it does that, it can cause vasoconstriction, right? So stress can definitely be a factor um, that's related to that. Oh, mm. So we talk about cortisol when we gain weight and the stress that can come with that and they'll addition into with menopause. So, and let me just bring here, there was a question, can you get cancer from taking hormonal therapy pills um, when you're over the age of 50? So I guess in general, they, that, the question again, was, the question can, again. You, can you get cancer from taking hormonal therapy pills when you're over the age of 50? Yeah. You know, get cancer is an increased risk for developing cancer depending on what your symptoms are. So for example, when you go into menopause, that means your ovaries have shut down, they stop working. So that means you're not making enough estrogen for you to have a period. So remember that kind of period cycle that I gave you? So what's happening during that process, your body's making just enough estrogen 
to stimulate all of the things. You don't get pregnant and it bloop, you have a period. So that process is a timeable thing. When you go into menopause, it's a flat line. There's nothing. So that means that you should not have a period ever after you go into menopause. If you get bleeding, that's like a period after menopause, that is not normal. And so the issue with that is, is there something in the lining of the uterus that's being stimulated to cause that response? And so estrogen is the stimulator for your body to have a period. So what happens is sometimes when people have postmenopausal bleeding or bleeding after menopause, and you take extra estrogen on top of that, or you're feeding your body some extra estrogen that it doesn't necessarily need, it increases your risk of developing uterine cancer specifically. Breast cancer is another common one, plus or minus on that. That's a conversation that you have with your um, breast um, specialist as well as your primary care doctor because there's certain breast cancers that have estrogen positive receptors, plus or minus, um, and then there's some that don't. And so depending on what that is and what your risk level is, that's a conversation I have with your doctor. So that was, so thank you for that. Thank you for that breakdown. Do all doctors, are all doctors able to prescribe um, hormone, hormone replacement therapy? No. Um, so typically the people that will prescribe it is going to be your um, neighborly OBGYN um, or primary care doctors can also prescribe it. It just depends on their comfort level, but definitely a conversation to have. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for that. This is a funny one, but it's not because I'm sure we've probably all heard it. So someone said in the chat that her childhood friend's mother said that if you take, um, let me see, oh yes, hormone therapy will make you grow a mustache. Is there any truth to that? No. Um, so let's talk about that. So when we are, so one of the differentiators between female characteristics and male characteristics, so phenotypes, if you remember that in biology, is what do you phenotypically look like? And so most of the time, people that have hair growth, like a mustache, a beard, chest hair, tends to be related to men, right? That's what you think about, get a full mustache. What's stopping women from getting that is estrogen. So um, it's estrogen and testosterone are kind of like similar, but they kind of yin and yangish. So um, men have some level of estrogen in the body, but they don't have enough to cause them to have a period, to cause them because they don't have a uterus, right? But they don't cause them to have like the hair growth stuff, right? Women have just enough testosterone, but not enough testosterone to cause them to have a beard, full grown beard. So what happens when you go towards menopause and estrogen is coming out the scene, you have that underlying testosterone that's still there. So it will give you some increase in hair growth as you age because the estrogen is not kind of acting as the police for that. So laser, waxing, all of the things will help with that. Um, so, yeah. One more question, and I'll say two. Um, first, is there a way we can receive the presentation um, that is that was used today? I think there were a lot of um, ladies asking about the possibly having the presentation as a reference tool. And I'll go to the to the chat, and then I'll turn it over to Madam President. Um, have you had patients experience emotional auras and or urinary urgency just prior to a hot flash. Hmm. Okay. So not exactly sure what an emotional aura is, but urinary symptoms can definitely be associated with um, postmenopausal things. So I guess that would be one um, com uncommon thing that people don't actually associate it with it is urinary tract infections or vaginal infections. So like vaginitis is like B BV or whatever. Um, and that's just because the lack of estrogen that's in the vagina that's no longer supporting it changes the pH balance. So you get increased risk for having urinary tract infections. You can get increased risk for having vaginitis. So the treatment for that is actually not hormone replacement therapy because hormone replacement therapy is only to, to treat hot flashes. It has nothing to do with your vagina. So what you want to do is do vaginal estrogen because that helps to replace it back. So that can help to reduce the frequency of hot flashes, sometimes urgency um, when you have to go to the bathroom frequently um, or vaginal infection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, we could go on for another hour, I'm sure, because we didn't even get deep in the sex drive um, piece and all of this. So maybe that's a part two, um, Dr. Crystal, and maybe that's a part two to this. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Scales. The, there are so many questions. Um, I do encourage everyone to make sure you um, click on the QR code that was provided. I'm sure we could get that back up to provide Dr. Scales some feedback on the presentation and we can find out how we can receive that presentation as well. I'm going to turn it over to our chapter President um, Helene Fisher. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Dr. Scales. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. So for me, when I entered the wear white pants anytime you want to club, <laughs> when I had a hysterectomy, uh, your questions or your responses to uh, postmenopause were the ones that were most insightful for me. But everything you shared tonight, everything was quite helpful. Um, we had, um, when I looked, I think the highest number was probably about almost 80 of our participants. Uh, we had about 80 registrants. And usually when we have registrants for our events, uh, we probably have half of those who participate. We had about the same number who registered to participate tonight. So that speaks volumes about this topic and what people wanna hear. So what Sara Connie said about a part two, hopefully we'll have a part two and that you will join us for part two. Uh, thank you for explaining so many things that we've experienced that we've been confused about, about our bodies and menopause. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thank you for explaining it in simple terms. So thank you so absolutely. much for joining us this evening. Uh, no, I want to thank the Health Initiatives Committee for this topic. I don't know whose idea it was, but it was a great, great, great idea to have this topic. Um, I want to thank the participants for joining us this evening, and uh, please fill out the survey. We want to know what you think about uh, tonight's event. We want to know what other topics you want to hear about. Uh, we'll try to get um, your questions answered if Dr. Scales will uh, be so kind as to respond to uh, these questions if she didn't already, because she talked about a whole lot of things this evening. And if you are interested in learning more about the Fairfax County Alumni Chapter, please uh, look us up on social media. Uh, check us out on our website, fcacdst.org. And with that, we thank you for joining us and may you live in good health and good night. Have a very good evening, everyone. And Dr. Scales, if we didn't take your picture this evening, if you would hang out with the committee, uh, we'll take a quick picture with you and the committee this evening. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a very blessed evening. Good night.